that's that's the, the, the second episode is like so now uh, and then Buddha didn't by refusing to identify himself as human he didn't mean that he was not human in fact he just wanted to tell and later throughout his teaching he would say Buddha is essentially a human being so Acharya uh, Manusa and then today uh, I wanted to discuss uh, uh, how Buddha humanized uh, divinity in terms of the four Brahma Viharas. That is what we are going to discuss this morning. And most of you, and you are familiar with the Brahma Viharas. Uh, so let me first get the list. Is it okay for I erase everything? Uh, the, the 
culture, the religious culture that was only in place. Actually, that is one of the key lessons that I got uh, in Sri Lanka way back in 90, early 90s. I left Sri Lanka in 1997, first to Singapore and then to the US. And then one of my teachers told me who had been to the States, he said that. Uh, now, uh, and then he told me, his, well, I remember what, how he said that to me. Uh, as per the Buddha's advice, you are going to the West, not to transplant your personal Buddhist culture, Asian culture, onto the body of the American, American culture. And then, explain, separate, filter uh, Dharma from, the, uh, from its cultural uh, modification. And so that uh, just get the cream and then tell the people, uh, teach the people only the Dharma, not this cultural uh, variation or cultural interpretation of the Dharma. And so that thereby you can let them choose what they, will, they would like to choose as long as you help them incorporate what you say into their own way of thinking, way of thinking being necessarily essential culture. And, and so that, so that, and you will have your mission accomplished, fulfilled. So that's the way Buddha did that too. Because like America, America is a nation of different cultures. First time I didn't notice that, when I traveled through different states, I noticed that. The culture in New York is way different than that in California. And the culture in Idaho, uh, Vermont, uh, Utah. Uh, the culture in that part of the U.S. is very different than the culture in, in, in the, uh, how to say, in California, Florida, and popular states. And the Texas culture is very different than the culture in California and New York. So that I, I noticed that too. And then so I know that England from different com countries. That's how it is. Even the language is in New York, New York, New Yorkers speak so fast. Why? Because they, they live a busy life. Over time, generations later, it has become kind of genetic. Even if a New Yorker, uh, I'm teasing them, not insulting them. I call the right to their face. You speak too, too, so, too fast, probably you are from New York. <laughs> yes. But they are, they are speaking more nasal as well. But anyway, that's because that's how they have been. That's their culture. So for that, so that's my one of my teachers reminded me. When you go to the West, that's what you are supposed to do. And Buddha himself also recommended that too. When Buddha sent certain monks out to different uh, regions of India, within India, and he educated them as to the cultural difference that they would uh, notice when they go to those uh, places. Some, in certain areas, people are very tough. They are fighters, and you must know the kind of language you must speak uh, with them. So that sort of uh, idea. So, and then when it comes to, uh, so Buddha was never against uh, the pre Buddhist culture, the culture that he was born into. Uh, so that uh, there was nothing called Catholic Christian culture before the birth of Jesus, right? And there was no Buddhist culture before Buddha was born. So that there was no Catholic culture before uh, Catholicism arose from Christianity. Okay. So our way of thinking is essentially cultural. So that, and Buddha knew that. So the same, that's why when people ask me, how can I believe it? I tell them, how can I believe That's not that's the wrong question. But one thing I don't know about is in nine. One thing I could say is that before speak, Buddha would first think and then he would know what to say. So that is one thing. He was never against establishment. That's one thing actually when it comes to humanizing. His teacher was humanism. He's a humanism. And he, he tried all his teachings are explained in human terms. Remember in previous lessons we discussed Nirvana. Nirvana is an internalized process rather than a cosmic process. Samsara is a, is a humanistic process rather than a divine process or cosmic process. 
and put the simply disconnected the vertical connection with the divine and that is the only difference when it comes to Buddhism and uh, theistic religions uh, it's a different story that people nowadays Buddhists would identify with as a kind of divine but in order to see the middle ground whenever they ask me whenever people ask me whether it is divine or was divine I would, then I would just explain that term Acharya Manusa man extraordinary or the uh, theosophic man man that is his identity identity man but there is something uh, uh, different in his case that is theosophic uh, so that uh, uh, divine in his mind because he transformed his mind as it was in enlightenment all about now these are called Brahma Viharas I put uh, S in parenthesis because Brahma Vihara is a Pali word, but in English nowadays most Western Buddhists know the term Brahma Viharas. They call it Brahma Viharas, like samsara. So the Brahma, you know the term, right? Brahma is uh, the creator god in pre-Buddhist and uh, uh, in pre-Buddhist India, even today, to this day, Brahma is the creator. That's God. And then Vihara. Vihara means living. Uh, oh. About here. Yeah. About. Divine about. Divine living. So, uh, even Hindus, even non-Buddhists, even those who didn't accept Buddha's teaching uh, would like his explanation of Brahma Vihara, as he said. Uh, in order to see Brahman, you don't have to go to him. You can see him within yourself. When you live uh, in accordance with four principles, that he would uh, radiate uh, on daily basis. And he said, Brahma would uh, radiate uh, metta, loving kindness, or unconditional love, that's the meaning, Brahma metta, maitri. Metta, maitri is unconditional love. We, later I will go through the terms again. For now we can write it down. Then. Metta, maitri is loving kindness or unconditional love. There's a reason why you call it unconditional. And second, uh, karuna. Karuna is compassion. Karuna is compassion. Third, mudita. Mudita is altruism. Altruism. A-L-T-R-U ISM altruism or joy or sympathetic joy or joy in other people's uh, happiness that you are happy when others are happy sympathetic joy or altruism joy in others success considering it's your own success uh, Fourth is uh, upeka, upesha, that is equanimity, E-Q-U-A-N-I-M-I-T-Y, equanimity. But these terms, these are the generally accepted English terms, English parallels, uh, translations. So, uh, and he said, in different teachings, now, just like, just like Brahma radiates, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upesha pervades these four uh, 
uh, throughout the entire universe, you may, if you, uh, if you like to see him within, really practice these four principles in your life. Through these four divine principles, you become divine. That was his uh, definition of Brahma. We want to see Brahma. Remember, we touched upon one uh, term in one of our previous sessions. Brahma uh, uh, Remember, we discussed Sahavita is uh, union. Sahavita is union. So Brahma means Brahma Sahavita. Union with Brahma. That's absolutely theistic. That uh, Brahma Sahavita. Union with Brahma. Or reunion with Brahma. God. He created you and then you are going back to him. That's how you, you see that in obituaries, right? And you say that he was called home. He went back to the union. God, yeah, that's right, yeah. So, Brahma Sahabita. Okay. Besides that, being Sanskrit term, the same thing is a universal term that is used by any theistic religion across the world. Brahma Sahabita. Union with Brahma, union with God, going back to Him. Um, so, Big G or little G? That's big G. Mm -hmm. That's big G, yeah. Mm -hmm. There are so many little G's in Buddhism. So many. Multiple. In Hinduism, 33 million. I said 33 million. When I studied them both in Miami, I had to use one uh, uh, film series by uh, Professor Ninian Smart of uh, UC, uh, UC Santa Barbara. London too, and then I had a whole series, an old classic series on world religions. And then there's one film, one video on 33 million God name, and that was the film on Hinduism. That was the title, 33 million Gods. And on the, the, the Buddhist one was very funny, and he said, first Buddhists convert Gods to Buddhism and then they worship. So, uh, First they, first they convert any god from any any pantheon, any non-Buddhist pantheon, and then when they comply with uh, the conditions that Buddhists put forward, they accept anyway because they convert unilateral conversion, and so that they worship them. There's a lot of Hindu gods also manifest in Buddhist pantheon. There's a funny story too. Uh, one Hindu god went to Sri Lanka. You know why? Because he never wanted to violate immigration, uh, right? So that he, he landed at the Sri Lankan immigration and then said, do you have visa? I have open visa. This is, uh, this, this is cosmic. And he said, I can go. No, no, no. This is different. This is not India. This is different. Mm -hmm. So that uh, you only get, uh, uh, how to say, restricted visa, right? We don't issue you cosmic visa. We only issue you samsaric visa. <laughs> Meaning it is temporary. <coughs> you are not going to be divine forever. And you may lose it based on your behavior. <laughs> do you accept conditions? Okay. Yes, we do, sir. Okay, divine. So that's one story. Uh, and I model the, like, some, some human. Right? Uh, so the Buddhism absorbed lots of Hindu, Hindu gods, symbol Gs, into, into the Buddhist pantheon, but they have. Uh, they are reduced to some side level. And they are always uh, placed underneath, uh, uh, well below enlightened human beings. See, see, see the difference now? Enlightened. If you are enlightened as a human being, you are well beyond, you stay much uh, higher than gods who are yet to get enlightened. So, in Buddhism, uh, gods are not considered uh, permanently cosmic. They are cosmic, because cosmic means they are in heaven. But, they, they are subject to death. Uh, the only 
frequency, their body is not subject to decay. Why? So they, are uh, they are not enlightened. There could be some who are enlightened, but uh, only by because by listening to human being. That's that's the difference in Buddhism. It's other way around. Even in the Buddha's first sermon, as we just touched upon that in one of our class sessions, that he said the voice of enlightenment was heard in heavens, and the voice uh, the voice came from the earth. The voice came from the earth. That's how the Buddha first sermon says. And the divine beings were so surprised to hear that they were. It says they were waiting for that moment. They were waiting for eons of time, indefinite period of time, waiting for that particular human actually monster, that extraordinary human beings to appear in the human world and to rediscover the uh, the truth dharma. And so that uh, all other universe, uh, everyone, all other beings across the universe would hear that. That's, that's how uh, when you translate the first sermon of the Buddha in, in layman's language, that's what you, that's what you, that's what you get from that sutra. So then, and Buddha, Buddha always see Brahma uh, being a theistic, predominant theistic culture. Buddha never. Uh, Buddha never went against anything, anything, any ideas, any religious belief that were already in place. Instead, he simply reinterpreted. He absorbed them, he borrowed them, but reinterpreted them. Um, some, some of the things. And so that the key thing is humanizing or reducing cosmic idea, reducing some metaphysical ideas uh, to the human level. That's all about human life. Reduction of metaphysical ideas to the human level. If you want to write it down, I'll go say slowly. Humanizing is the reduction, humanizing or humanization, right? Two words either way is humanizing is the process. Action is humanization. Humanizing is the reduction of metaphysical religious metaphysical ideas to the human level. What if you ask, what if you ask a question in the text also, I mean uh, as you because certain things that you that I teach that you learn in this class are not universal. Whenever I Whenever that appears in the question papers, I would say, as you learn in your class, <coughs> always that phrase would occur first. That would be the first part of the question. As you learn or as you heard in your class, explain humanizing something. Why I say, as you heard in your class, probably you wouldn't hear that anywhere else. It has to be very specific. When, when the invigilators of the Universal Academy uh, go through the go through my grades, I mean grading, and they will know, okay, okay, this guy is said as they heard in their class, okay, now give him the freedom. <laughs> I know how to be tricky. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't pay checks on others to cheat them. But that's an in good faith in order to get the message that because sometimes I say that Chetanam Bikkave Kampamadami Karma is your intention. I have that in my mind all the time. So the first one is Metta, my three. Now, this is the general translation is uh, five more minutes. So, uh, for the break. Uh, is Mitra. Maitri comes from the Sanskrit word Mitra. Actually, Mitra was a Vedic, uh, Vedic term. Is. It comes from Mitra. Even today, in Sanskrit, in Hindi, in Sinhalese, that, that is my mother tongue that I speak in Sri Lanka, and may, in many Indian languages, Mitra means friend. Mitra is 
friend. For example, when I speak in Sinhala, I say, you are my mitra, you mean you are my friend. So it comes from the root mitra. Mitra means friend, my tree. My tree is the uh, process of becoming friends. That's what my tree means. Uh, that is loving kindness. But as a spiritual, uh, it's a kind of spiritual love. Metta. But it's unconditional love. How is this unconditional? Because usually love that you talk about is conditional. It's different that when you are driven by absolute romance and you will say to your heart, even if you don't love me, I'm going to you are my everything in my life, I'm going to love you for nothing else. Even if you leave me starving to death, I will still love you. And you hit me, you kill me, you butcher me and you torture me, I still love you. And you will say that at the beginning and it's a little story sometime later. <laughs> When your romance disappears, when you experience with each other, you know what I mean? When you experience with each other, that kind of feeds the language that I'm supposed to know. When you, when you, you make love, and then your, your motivation is gone, your romance disappears, and then you begin to see, uh, and your partner doesn't look beautiful like before. Actually, she or he continues to look beautiful, but the thing is, now you are using different lenses. So that's why you don't see your partner like before. While you look at yourself as young forever, and you will complain your partner looks older. But if your partner says to the same, you get agitated, you get angry. Whereas the sexual love, whereas when it comes to uh, what is called unconditional, is different than conditional love. Unconditional love, Maitri, Metta in, uh, involves no sexuality. And you could still have my Metta towards your sexual partner. But as long as you don't expect anything in return. But that's when you expect something in return, that's called conditional. Conditional, that's what the conditions are. Credit card companies, print, of that fine print, so small, and you need a uh, magnifier, lots of, conditions. lots of conditions, and then they they put on purpose, they put so many conditions on purpose in mind, that, that fine small print, uh, to get you fed up, and you will never read them, until you just sign I agree. Right? So the conditions are, then this is mutual. So unconditional, in unconditional love, even if the other part doesn't love you, and you still uh, have some love towards them, and you can easily do that, why? There's no sexuality involved, there's no romance involved. But halfway through, you form a, a romantic uh, relationship with your friend. And then what happened? Two hours later, you see your partner talking to another guy or lady and then you get angry. And you never got angry for the last 10 years as long as you had an unconditional relationship with each other. Now that it has become conditional or romantic, you easily get angry or frustrated when you see your friend now talking to someone else. See the psychology behind that break. 